But I want to share with you a, a way to possibly, because again, the, the dynamic uh, that's been going on on Facebook and, and all the, the chatter on Facebook and all the social media today is, is the argument about Christmas. Is it pagan? Is it not pagan? Should we do it? Should we not? Is it okay to do everything? What, uh, what is it? And I was reminded of a lesson that I learned a long time ago that I want to share with you a little bit about how what I call, and that's why I, I named the title of this message, Unprescribed Worship. Unprescribed meaning something that we that, that was ad hoc or, or, or just we just decided to do, or it can also mean something that was unprovoked or, or was done without giving authority to do so. Unprescribed worship. How does y'all feel about it? That's the question. We discussed during our, during our Bible study time, the Bible discussion time, we talked about, you know, the timing of Yeshua's birth and does it matter, does it not, and how does he feel about syncretism and, and you know, worshiping, you know, the birth of Messiah through all these different symbolisms that have nothing to do with him. And how does he really feel about it? And I was actually reminded uh, of a story. It boils down to this simple, this simple question. Do we have the ability to make up ways that we decide to worship Him? And is He pleased with that? That's why I call this unprescribed worship. And how does y'all feel about it? Is it okay for us to just decide that we can just create a holiday, forms and practices of certain things that have been drawn from other places, and can do we have the authority? As some people, uh, a lot of some mainstream call they they call redeeming pagan holidays. They've taken a pagan holiday and they've redeemed it. In other words, they took it and they they smeared it off with an eraser and they put a Jesus stamp on it and that now makes it okay because somehow they portray that us as believers and followers of Yeshua um, and followers of God, of the, the God of the Bible, have somehow have that authority to do so. I'll first begin by reminding you that Catholicism done the same thing in many ways where they took what used to be pagan deities, and they put a saint stamp on it. They changed their name. They prescribed days of worship. Syncretism, where they took heathen practices and merged it with what we would call under the term of Christendom or Christianity. And by the way, I'm going to encourage you, I'm going to take a moment just to kind of plug this in right here. Don't be afraid of that term. There are a lot of people who are afraid of that term today. Because they say, I'm no longer a Christian. And I'll tell you right now, again, our God is bigger than a particular language. And when you make the claim, I'm no longer a Christian, you've cut your nose off to spot your face. That may sound hard. I don't mean to offend you if, if, if that's you. But I'm just telling you right now, when I was coming into this understanding, and I don't call it a new religion, a different religion, I'm trying to, to walk in as pure as I possibly can find according to this book. And I'm as liberal as this book allows me to be, but I'm as narrow-minded as the bindings of it from cover to cover. But I know without a shadow of doubt, if you would have walked up to me and you would have put your arm around me, no matter how big of a smile you had on your face and how friendly you seemed to be, if you would have said, Jason, I want to share with you the truth about the Bible. And you would have then told me, I'm no longer considering myself a Christian. I would have said, see ya. Because by definition, when you say you are that you're not a Christian tells me that you're anti-Christ. In other words, you have told me without saying the words so clear that I am not a follower of Jesus Christ of the Bible. Because when you look up the word definition, it's one who adheres to the teachings of Jesus Christ of the Bible. And again, I believe that I believe that 
that, that our Heavenly Father transcends His Word, transcends human language. And whether you call Him Jesus or whether you understand His name as it was, probably His mother called Him Yeshua. No matter, when you tell me that you're no longer a Christian or you do not identify a Christian, as a Christian, you just build a wall between me and you that is impenetrable. And you've not, you're not going to do yourself or anybody any good going around making that statement. Because by definition, now do I identify with what quote unquote mainstream Christianity looks like anymore? Absolutely not. But I'm not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And by definition, Christian means I believe in the Messiah of the Bible and His teachings. That's really what the definition of the word means. And I know people try to say that Christianity is pagan and that's nonsense. That's just people who are Facebook theologians and uh, legends in their own mind. But I want to talk about, again, and I'm sorry I just had to put that plug in there about Christian because I know it's a big deal and I hear it from a lot of people, but... Getting back on topic to unprescribed worship and how did y'all feel about it? We talked in a Bible study about, you know, Christmas and how it absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, just look at history and you can see that it's streaked with, with non-biblical. I only use the word pagan. People have thought of everything pagan. But non-biblical origins. He always tells us how he wants to be worshipped. He tells us what to do. If you if you sum it all down in one simple phrase, it's show me you love me by keeping my word. It's that simple. Nothing more and nothing less. Keep my commands. Don't add to them and don't take away from them. It's that easy. So, when we're thinking about all this and we're thinking about getting into that, oh, okay, let's worship God. I'm not, I'm not worshiping a tree. I'm not worshiping pagan. This is not paganism. I'm worshiping or I, or I am worshiping God through the celebration of the birth of His Son, the Messiah who came and died upon a tree for my sins and rose again the third day. Is it okay how I do that? Does it matter as long as I do it in some form or fashion? And I want to remind you of a, of a couple of things that took place in the scripture that kind of gives us an idea about how Yah feels, how Yahweh, our Heavenly Father, the God of heaven and earth, the creator of the universe, how he feels about when we make up our own ways to do things. And I'm going to set the stage, and I'm just going to share with you just a couple of verses. Set the stage is Moses. They've all, the children of Israel have met at the bottom of the mountain. They just come out of the Exodus. Traditionally, it's understood to be around 50 days uh, after the Exodus. is what's traditionally understood. And they're at the bottom of the mountain and they hear what we call the Ten Commandments. And when it gets to number 10, that we, as we understand number 10, the Tenth Commandment, thou shalt not covet. And then what we read in Exodus 20 and I'm paraphrasing this, so go on and study it. Test what I'm saying. The people of, of Israel, the children of Israel come to Moses and said, look, we, we've heard this from the mountain. We're afraid we're going to die if we hear anything more from Him. We don't want to die. So we're going to nominate you, Moses, to go and hear the rest of it. And then you come and tell us what he said and we will adhere to it. We will do it. Good luck. And then they back away from the mountain out of fear. And of course, prophetically, that's when we see that Moses becomes the mediator between Yah and man, which is a foreshadowed figure type of Messiah. But anyway, he goes up on the mountain and he hears all of the commands. The rest of the Ten Commandments, by the way. And... Um, that's a whole other message for another day, but the, the, the rest of the Ten Commandments. And then as he's up on the mountain, there's something happens. Exodus chapter 32 says, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mountain, the people gathered themselves unto Aaron and said unto him. Now, if you read, depending on which translation you read, it can be misleading. 
because it says, King James reads and says, Make go, it says, and said unto him, Up, make us gods, plural, make us gods which shall go before us. For as this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Little, a little bit concerning there because in the translator bias when they use the word gods. The basic Bible in English, the BBE translation, I believe articulates it a little more accurately, which as you'll see behind you on the screen says, and he took the gold from them and hammering it with an instrument, he made it into a metal image of a young ox and they said, this is your God, plural. And if you look, the word here in, in Exodus chapter 32, verse 1, doesn't really say, make us gods. It says, make us Elohim. Make us Elohim. And here it's the same way. He says, King James reads in, uh, uh, in verse uh, 4, uh, the King James reads, and he received from them uh, at their hand. And I'll go ahead and read it all. Let me start with verse 2 when it says that uh, they asked for them, for Aaron to go and, and to make a God for them um, because they don't know what's happened to this Moses guy. He's disappeared. Verse 2 said, And Aaron said unto them, Break off the gold earrings in which are in your ears of your wives and your sons and of your daughters and bring them unto me. I didn't like this verse when I read this verse. I'm going to tell you why. Because I saw that it was okay for a guy to wear earrings. I just didn't like that. I was raised guys that wear earrings, but evidently it was okay. So I had to repent of my sin of thinking that was awful. But uh, it's just a side note. It says, Break off uh, the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them unto me. And verse 3, And all the people break off the earrings which are in their ears and uh, brought them unto Aaron. And... I'm going to read verse 4 from the basic Bible in English. It says, and he took, well, I'm going to read it in King James first. It says, and, he, and he received them at their hand, at their hand uh, and fashioned it with a graving tool, and after he made it a, go, a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Again, we see that plural. These be thy gods. But the basic Bible in English reads as you see behind me. It says, And he took the gold from them, hammering it with an instrument. He made it into a metal image of a young ox and said, This is your God. O Israel, who took you out of the land of Egypt. This is your God. He made them a young ox. Now this says a molten calf. Worship the golden calf. And I can't help but tell you that I'm just being transparent with you. When I read that, I was like, Aaron was really not that bright. Because I'm going to be honest with you. If I was Aaron, and they would have come to me and they would have said, look, make us a god to go before us that brought us out of the land, I wouldn't have made a calf. I would have made something awesome, like a T-Rex or, or a Velociraptor or something like super cool, like Cable would have come up with. I'm like, Cable, my three-year-old son would have been like, he'd be like, let's do it like a calf, really? Let's do something super cool, like a dinosaur. Something ferocious and tough and, I mean, good grief, lion. Something, but he makes he makes them a calf, and I'm like, really, a calf? Can he make a big one? It's a little one, but in reality, again, that's translated by us. And we hear what it means is make for us a young ox. Now, why does he say young ox? Because a young ox is like a young man. He's full of vigor and he's strong. I don't like it because my son. I have a 19 year old son that I don't like it because he's becoming big and strong. And I feel like as a middle-aged man, I'm not anymore. And I realized the verbiage that the young ox was a symbolism of strength. He was strong. 
And I st- but I still struggle. Why would it be a cow? I mean, really? I mean, cowboys ride them things. They ain't that big of a deal. Until I've done some research. And we'll get into that in just a moment. But the whole keeping in the, into the mindset of unprescribed worship, how does y'all feel about it? Now, we all have heard the story all of our whole life how that they made a molten image. They made themselves a false god. It's amazing. By the hand of God, they just witnessed all of these things by the hand of Yahweh, lead them out of the land of Egypt, and less than 50 days later, or roughly around 50 days, less than two months, we'll give it that, let's give them two months, less than two months, they're like, look, we're done with him, Moses didn't come back, let's make us another one. And we're portrayed that they began to worship a false god, or a, worship an idol, if you will. And in the most pure sense, that is a true statement. But I want to share with you something about this. And I think it's, I'm looking at verse, let's see here. Oh yeah, verse 5. Very next verse. Pay attention. Now the question here was, were the children of Israel trying to just all of a sudden worship some cow? Is that what they were trying to do? Just worship some false god? They're going to come up with something? They need somebody. They need to tell somebody something. Who did it? He did. They need to tell them something? Or were they coming up with it? Absolutely not. We see in verse 5, it says, And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast unto the Lord in King James. If you have your Bible in front of you, any of you have Exodus chapter 32, verse 5, is there another word for Lord there by chance? You have Adonai, which is the English word for Lord, or really the Hebrew word for Lord, I mean. English is Lord, is the equivalent to that. Have you had anything else? Because it's interesting. What we see there. If you have a King James Bible, an old one anyway, you'll see that L-O-R-D is all capitalized in that verse. And what that verse says is for tomorrow is a feast to this guy. Yahweh. The Tetragrammaton. This wasn't a feast of Mithra or Moloch. This was tomorrow's a feast to this one. Whether you pronounce it Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahovah, whatever. The God of the Bible, he said, tomorrow is the feast to this guy. And I realized for the first time in my life, they were not trying to worship just some golden calf. They had created for themselves a, another way to worship this guy. They weren't trying to worship another god. It ain't like, well, we're going to shift gears. We're going to, you know, we're going to worship Buddha. No. They created a golden ox to worship this guy. The creator of heaven and earth. The one in whom they'd seen the miracles happen. To lead them out of the land of Egypt. I'm going to make, I'm going to, I want to remind you of another story. In Leviticus chapter 10. Verses 1 and 2. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron took either of them his censer and put fire therein, and they put incense there, and they offered strange fire before Yahweh, in which he commanded them not. And there went out and there went out fire from Yahweh and devoured them, and they died before Yahweh. You see it recount again in Numbers chapter three, verse four. Everybody wants to get all turnt and all bent out of shape trying to figure out just exactly what was this strange fire. What exactly was it 
that Nadab and Abihu did that caused Yahweh to strike them dead. The reality is, is you and I don't really need to know what particular, well, I mean, did, did they get a f- coals out of that fire instead of this fire? Or was it really fire at all? Was it figurative speech? Was it strange fire? The reality is, is the figurative speech in this whole ordeal is it was a false way to worship Him in which He had not prescribed it to be done. Keep it simple. Let's go back. Exodus 32. They decided they were going to worship Him in a way He had not prescribed them to do. Is that how we do Santa Claus or a Christmas tree? That we are all, are we indeed guilty of also offering strange fire to Yahweh? If He does not change, He doesn't like us to worship Him in ways He didn't prescribe. He just wants us to obey Him, do it the way He asked for it to be done. And I use this analogy oftentimes, and I'm going to pick on Brian for just a second. Are you, can you just, can you just, Honor your wife and love her the way you see fit. It's funny you're saying that because the same thought was going through my head. Like, my wife tells me to kiss her every day and I go shake her hand. Just, How's that going to work out for you? Yeah. I mean, my wife's not going to appreciate it if I think, man, I love my wife. I'm going to make her get up at 5 o'clock every morning with me and go fishing. Can love you. In the same way, how would it feel uh, to you men if your wives woke you up? At 6 o'clock every morning and said, hey, uh, let's go shopping. (laughs) What? You want to talk? Yeah. And he's probably wanting to sleep. He's tired. My point is this. We can get into nuances and I can cause all kind of marital spats right real quick in a hurry if I want to. But the reality is this here. Is here's the problem that we have. There is a prescribed way that your particular spouse desires to be loved. I'm going to put this plug in right here. If you've never read it, I do tell you that I do believe without a shadow of a doubt that a that reading the book, The Five Love Languages, is a healthy book for you to read. I'll, I'll tell you just how healthy I think it is that if you come to me and say, oh, me and Betty Lou, we decided we love each other and we're going to get married. I'm going to say, good, we're going to do some marital counseling. The first thing you need to do is read The Five Love Languages book. Because you need to learn what her love language is, and he needs to know, uh, she needs to know what your husband's is. Because man and I have our own testimony about that book and about how ways that I, I have a love language, and most people try to speak in their own love language. That's why they try to love, and I tried to do that, and I was frustrated because it seemed like no matter how hard I tried, no matter how hard I tried to show my wife I loved her, it was didn't amount to a hill of beans. And I was like, man, this one's hard to please. Until I realized that I wasn't speaking her dialect. And I found that being able to show her I love her, I feel like I have to try less, strive less, and it she seems to be happier. And that just didn't register to me until I actually applied the principle. And why do I say that? It's because this Yahweh says, this is how I want you to love me. Show me you love me by doing this. Don't do that. Do this. If your wife loves pizza, but she hates Greek food, you don't plan a date to take her to a Greek restaurant and plan to get very far. Speaking her love language. Do it the way that they want to be loved. My wife doesn't show me she loves me by buying me a pair of shoes. She bought me a fishing rod. And now she's speaking my language. And so 
Yahweh prescribes a way for us to love Him. And we have in the Scripture, we have a testimony, two different times at least, and I know there's more. We have another one. We can go to the Sons of Solomon where we have, uh, we have, and I always get them backwards. It's uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Yeah, it's Jeroboam the one that offered, that changed the date, right? I always get those guys mixed up for some of the reason, no matter how many times. But Jeroboam decided he was going to change the time of worship and a place of worship. And God didn't like that very much, so much that he killed his whole seed <laughs> because he changed a festival from that was prescribed from the seventh month, 15th day, to the eighth month. And he set up high places in Dan and Bethel. He didn't like that. He didn't like this, what they done. Well, they were trying, by the way, they weren't trying to worship Joe Blow, the pagan god. They were trying to worship Yahweh through the image of a golden calf or a golden young ox. And God hated it so much, what did He say? He said, I'm going to kill all y'all. And I'm going to start over. And Yahweh pled as their intercessor and said, please don't forgive them. Moses dealt a hard hand though. He come down there and he crushed that thing up and he ground it up into powder and he put it, mixed it with water and he made them drink it. But he hated it so bad he was going to destroy all of them for what they'd done. He did destroy Nadab and Abihu and he destroyed Jeroboam's entire lineage because of what he'd done. Now, still, let's get back to the point of, okay, well, if they weren't, Jason, if they weren't trying to make some fake God, then why did they, why did they use a bull? And that was rude. My question anyway, I was like, I could have thought of something bigger, stronger, badder, tougher, meaner. I mean, could have used a rhinoceros or something. Something that could have done some wrecking, made some damage, something mean and tough. And, you know, I'm thinking like a man thinks, you know, give me something tough. So I begin to write, why in the world? I think the greatest question we could ever ask ourselves, when you read something about Bible you don't understand, ask one simple question, why, and start looking for the answer. Why? And everybody loves to go to the, to, to, they want to say, well, because the, because the Egyptians, and da, 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 and they start going to Apis, the, the bull god, you know. Oh, they were going back to worshiping the Egyptian god. Really? I would have trouble with that because it was there that God just stomped a mud hole in all of their gods and they just walked out with all their possessions. Why would they go back to that god who was definitely the loser? So I struggled with that. Why would they go back to worshiping a a bull deity. You know, this bull god, Apis, why would they go back to, to worshiping that guy when literally Yahweh just drug him through the mud and made him look like a fool? Why would they do that? Simple answer is probably because we're human and that's kind of the stupid stuff we kind of humans do, but I just struggle with the fact that that's what they've done. It was really not far removed when that happened. Until I start researching that, and I would recommend this something to take a look at. I'm not going to tell you that you believe everything that's in it, but this is a world called The World's Oldest Alphabet. I don't know if any of you have ever seen this book. But it's very interesting. I can share with you if you want to take a look at it after the service. I, I, if I would have been as cool as Jeremy does when he does his cool slideshows, I would have put this on the screen. So what I'm going to do on the, on the, on the weeks, I'm going to start teaching. I'm going to give him all the verses, and I'm going to let him start making my slideshows where y'all think I'm cool like Jeremy. But I love you, Jeremy. I love your slideshows, by the way. I wish I could graduate to that. I hope one day I'll grow up. But uh, anyway, it's interesting right here. And if you've ever done the research, you might look, and when it comes back to the God of El, which is the one we identify as this guy, the God of El, it's interesting that his name, uh, we get it from the Aleph and the Lamed. And if we go all the way back, interestingly enough, to the old alphabet and what we call the Paleo-Hebrew original, go all the way back. Actually, we could trace this all the way back to the uh, uh, to you know the the Hebrew uh, consonantals of the Iron Age, which goes all the way back to like 
possibly to 1150 BC. And it, as it evolved, and we can get it back, and it's funny because you can look and there's two symbols. Olive and Lamed. They, the Lamed is the shepherd's staff. It's just, it just looks like an upside down J. And it refers to a shepherd or a teacher. And then the other one, the other letter in his pictograph form is an ox head. It's the head of a bull. So to make sense of this, Aaron formed an image based off of the, the pictographic letter that symbolized his name. The ox head was literally part of the way you spelled his name. It makes much more sense why they chose that. And I'm like, okay, I can bite down on that. So they weren't trying, they just didn't come up with some random image. This was an image that they were familiar with. Because in ancient times, from ancient times, we have ox have been symbols of strength because of their ability to work and to perform tasks. And then we have his very name, the God of El, who his name is symbolized by an ox head. Does it? makes sense to you now the way it makes sense to me why they would use that and here was my here's the point that I'll wrap up with for the sake of time and my prayer is just maybe you learned something you didn't know today uh, that's my prayer maybe you're just like man he's just mumbling I know all that already and sorry but I didn't so I'm just relaying it all to you at one time I didn't understand that but it's funny that even when they used an image that was directly related to the way his name was written down because it was an unprescribed form of worship. And he had already said, don't make images. Images of the heavens or on any creature of the earth or whatever form, don't make them. But then they tried to make an image of an earthly animal that symbolized who he was literally by the writing on the page, if you will, or the writing on the papyrus, paper, stone, whatever you want to call it. God despised that so much that he wanted to destroy all of them. And it makes me wonder, it makes me think, how does he feel about when we take these unprescribed forms of worship? Here's the bottom line. And this is the message that I send out to all those people who are saying, oh, Christmas is okay. There's no, we can do that and we can celebrate it this way because there's no pagan origins. I don't care if there's not. The bottom line it is it is an unprescribed worship. That's not the way he asked to be worshiped. And when I create all of these things, in his name, how am I any different than what happened in Exodus 32 or in Leviticus 10 with Nadab and Abihu? My thing is, is let's just do what he says and be done with it. Like when, and I know I'm bad for this. Maybe all men are bad for this. I don't know. But I'm, sometimes I fall, I fall prey. I, I, I catch myself doing the same thing because if my wife plainly says to me, if I say, hey, what could I do that you would really show you I love you or whatever? And she gives me a prescription. This is what you do. My thing is, is I want to go down there and I go, okay, well, she said, take me out for dinner and a movie and I start ad-libbing I'm like well we'll make it I'll make it even better we'll go 
400 miles away and do it. Spend money to go to a place she doesn't really care for. To stay the night. We'll go to Cabela's and to TJ Maxx. And we'll do all these things. And I start ad-libbing. I start adding things that she, that she didn't prescribe, right? She told me, hey, look, if you do this, you show me you love me. This is, I'll be appreciated if you show me this. But when I start adding to or taking away from, I start manipulating the formula, you see? And so what we should do, let's just stick to the prescription. When the doctor says you have this and I'm going to prescribe you this, take that. And not other things. I'm like, well, my finger hurts really bad, and where I cut my finger, and the pres- the doctor prescribed me pain medication to help with the pain. But it would probably do pretty good. I bet it'd work even better if I took twice as many as they said and drank a fifth of liquor. That'd probably help out, wouldn't it? No, I could kill myself. Why don't you just do, and I'm sure, speaking for the doctors that may hear this, I'm sure that you're like, yeah, if you just do what I ask you to do, it would have been fine. Don't add to it or take away from it. Just do what I ask you to do, and it would probably heal up just fine. And we should do the same thing. We have, we have an entire book that tells us from cover to cover how God desires to be loved and how we show our appreciation, how we share His character and His nature to the entire world. He tells us just exactly how to do it. Why do we think that we need to improve on it? Let's just keep it simple. And as I go, as we close out, uh, I want to pray a blessing over you and, and hopefully that You'll stay with us and we can eat food together and fellowship together. But speaking about origins, and if you do have questions, if you're still like, I'm just not convinced, I don't know if this originated from there, and I'd really like to know because it matters to me. I did, I forgot I even had this book, um, but a dear friend of mine, Kelly McDonald, who's come and spoke here, and he'll come back. He's, he's got a wife that's uh, about to have twins. Uh, she's due any time to have twins. And... Uh, he told me that when things settle down, we're going to try to work it out where he can come back and speak again. But he'd written a book. And if you've ever, if any of you ever met him, I don't know how many of you met Kelly in here, but I know some of you met him. But man, he's a brainiac. I love him to death. I wish I had his mind. He's brilliant. He's like a walking, talking encyclopedia library. And, uh, but he has a lot of historical information. But he has a book that he wrote called Ancient uh, Roman Celebrations and the Adaptation of Early Christianity that I would recommend to you. Small book but full of information. And I will tell you something about him. He backs up what he says. Um, I mean, he totally backs it up with his, in his bibliography in the back. He backs up his, where he gets his information uh, and he backs, backs it up with historical documentation and facts. Uh, so I would recommend that book to you if it's something, it may be something you, somebody's on the fence, you want to look at the book, um, check it out for yourself and, and maybe you want to share it with a friend or something. Um, but that's a, it's a good book to read. But again, I want us to consider that, in a nutshell, recapping. Yah gave us a way to worship Him. Told us how to do it, when to do it, where to do it. Doing it other ways doesn't really earn us brownie points with God. If we want, if we want to please Him, we should act righteously, which means to act rightly. And we act rightly by sharing uh, what He prescribed to us, to the world. That's why we celebrate the feast when we do, the holy days in the Bible, because it testifies to who He is, it testifies to His goodness. It's, it, it is a foreshadow of the coming of Messiah, both back then when He came the first time and when He's coming back. Uh, it testifies to that too. Uh, and let's, let's work on, you know, He gave us... He, he gave us the algorithms and he, and he gave us the, the diagram, the blueprints, if you will, to be, if we lived it correctly, he gave us the architectural plans to build the perfect light to be for him. And that's to model the perfect light in whom he sent, Yeshua. 
And let's don't forget that that's our goal. That's the purpose for our life. It's our reasonable service uh, to offer ourselves as living sacrifice to Him. Not our will, but His will be done.